I've become dependent on the radio. I turn it on as soon as I come home from work and I forget to turn it off when I go to bed. I depend on it to fill in a companion constantly talking to me, entertaining me. It's wrong. I must stop being afraid of silence. There's nothing to fear. I'll just sit here and listen to it. Oh, I thought it was coming for me. Oh dear, I'm shaking. No, Mary, stop it. Pull yourself together. Still, it was like a warning. A warning of approaching death. Coming. Coming for... No. Listen, Mary, listen to the silence. What's that? silly of me. My own heartbeat. Oh. Quiet. Quiet, you. Let me listen to the silence. Why am I doing this? Why have I turned off the radio? Why am I deliberately sitting here frightening myself? I must be going mad. No. Don't say that. Don't even think of it. You're not mad, Mary Smith. You're perfectly sane. Why have I always been so lonely? Like a stranger in a strange land all my life. Indifferent parents, lovers without the pretense of love. Then solitary confinement as age inevitably conquers looks. What will happen to me when infirmity takes all? No! That's the easy way out! I will listen to the silence. I will. I know someone is there. I've always known. I was afraid, that's true, but not now. Come into the silence and join me. Come in. I'll be brave. I'll listen. Here I am, oh. at last. Who are you? The radio and your voice prevented me. Where are you? Here. But I am here. But I can't see you. Can you see the voices that come from your radio? Who are you? Your grandfather. My grandfather? A seaman, an explorer. Adventure was my life, still is. And what a great adventure it has been journeying to you. But, well, you, you can't be either of my grandfathers. You speak with a foreign accent. They were born in London. Besides, they're dead. They were not your grandparents. And your so-called parents were not your parents at all. What are you saying? Listen, Mary, I have something to tell you. Your real father was my son, Stefan. He was Polish, like me. He didn't have the opportunity to marry the girl he loved. He was a political activist. And he was killed six months before you were born. Natasha, my daughter-in-law, your real mother, died giving birth to you. And you were taken to an orphanage in Warsaw. You were one of the lucky ones. A refugee family brought you with them when they fled from Poland to England. Here, they did a secret deal with an English couple, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, who adopted you. 
They were childless and desperately wanted a girl. But afterwards, they regretted it. They found you ungrateful, solitary, and temperamental. Quietly, they hated you and were secretly delighted when you ran away. As for you, without knowing it, you ached for your own country, your own people. You are Polish through and through. I have been trying to reach you, but you never gave me the silence, the deep silence I needed until tonight. I'm dreaming. Tell me I'm dreaming. No, 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 you're not dreaming. Entranced, yes. For the first time, you have opened the door which deep down inside you knew was always there. The door between the two worlds. But I'm not psychic. I've never been to a seance in my life. You have always possessed psychic powers, but you have been secretly afraid of embracing them. Believe me, Mary, there is nothing to fear, nothing at all. I thought that hearing you like this, well, that I'd be afraid. But I'm not. It seems, well, natural to be sitting here. It is natural, Mary. Everything that happens is natural. How could it be otherwise? We must keep our voices down. They might hear us downstairs. Only you can hear me. No one else can. Why have you come? First, to tell you who you are, this I have done. Secondly, and important to me, is to tell you stories. Wonderful stories that make up my life. But there is time for that. You have the rest of your life in which to hear them. All you need to do is to open the door to the silence. And I will come into it. Now, go to bed and sleep. Go to work tomorrow as usual. In the evening, when you return, do not switch on the radio, but listen to the silence. I'll be waiting to come in. Good night, Maria. Maria? But I've always been called Mary. Maria is your real name. Maria. It's me. It's really me. Oh, good evening, Miss Smith. Hello, Mrs. Maple. Had a good day, love? Yes, thank you. Everything all right, is it? Uh, yes. Yes. Oh, that's good. Had a visitor the other evening, did we? Uh, no. Why do you ask? Nothing, really, but... Well, it's just that Jenny thought she heard you talking to someone, that's all. I said she must be talking nonsense, because I didn't hear you let anyone in. You're right, Mrs. Maple. There was no one with me. I was quite alone. Good evening. Good evening, dear. once more, I wonder. Or was it merely a dream? Oh, no. Please tell me it wasn't a dream. I won't turn on the radio. I'll just sit here quietly and listen. Listen to the silence. Hello, Maria. Oh, hello. I've been thinking about you all day. Have you? That's nice. Where do you live? There is no way in which I can describe where I live. Your language does not contain the words. But I shall tell you tales of how I lived when I was in your world. Oh. What's the matter? 
So you are dead, then? Only in your limited sense of the word. Do I sound dead? No, not a bit. But... Yes? Tell me, what is it like to die? Do not fear dying, Maria. If you've enjoyed life as much as I have, you will find dying bitterly disappointing. But in time, that feeling will pass and you will discover that dying is another form of birth. And you will be content at the prospect. You make it sound almost pleasant. Well, it's less of an ordeal than I thought. Tell me about when you were in my world. Tell me about your adventures when you were here. Well, I was a captain of a ship and traded in the Malay archipelago and along the seashores and river banks of Africa. Once I remember when I was trading in ivory, and yet after all that, I had managed to survive and return to England with the hold laden and the ship and all its crew safe. That was wonderful. Oh, tell me another story, Grandfather. Please, please. I feel like a child again. Good. I am pleased. Except when I was a little girl, no one ever told me stories. That's all in the past now. I will tell you more stories tomorrow when you come home from work. Promise? Of course. And the evening after that. And every evening of your life until all the tales are told. Good night, little Maria. Good night, Grandfather. Oh, how marvellous. To have something to look forward to every evening for the rest of my life. I'm so fortunate and so happy. I've never ever really been happy before. And this, this can go on and on and on. Robin. That's right. Let's sit down, please. Thank you. Now, Mary, you've been working here for some years now, and I think I can safely say we know one another well enough for you to tell me if there was something worrying you. Isn't that so? Yes, Mr. Robin. Good. That's what I thought. Except that I don't know what you mean. There isn't anything troubling me. Oh, isn't there? I'm not blind, you know. Simply because I allow you to get on with your work quietly in the corner of the office doesn't mean to say I'm not interested in the welfare of my employees. For instance, you've lost a lot of weight these past few weeks. Have I? Yeah. I was wondering if you have a, a good meal when you get home from work each evening. Well, occasionally I may miss... Ah, exactly. What do we do at lunchtime isn't enough to keep a sparrow alive. I'm all right, Mr. Robbins. Really, I am. <clears throat> then there's your work. My work? I hate to say it, but you've been growing, well, absent-minded of late. Your work is suffering. Little inaccuracy, spelling errors. Nothing serious, yet. But enough to make me want to have this little chat with you. I'm wondering if something's happened in your private life. Uh, a bereavement? No. No, nothing like that, Mr. Robbins. On the contrary, it's, it's more a rebirth. I'm very happy at the moment. And in fact, I couldn't be happier. I see. Well, Mary, I, I suggest you take the opportunity of keeping a check on your strange euphoria. Be as happy as you like in your own time, but while you're here, I'd like you to take a little more care with the work I'm paying you for. You understand? Grandfather. Grandfather, are you there? I am here, my child. I didn't tell you this before, but 
Two months ago, my employer, Mr. Robbins, called me into his office and told me that my work was deteriorating. Today, he called me into his office once more and gave me the sack. He calls it making me redundant, but it amounts to the same thing. Before, before you came into my life, I would have been terrified, but I'm not now. In fact, I'm glad. I should get unemployment pay, and I should be able to spend more time with you, listening to your tales. Good. Good. Tell me something, Grandfather. Did you ever write them down? Never had the time. I was always too busy living my life, not writing about it. But you have time, lots of it. Why don't you write them down for me? Write them in my voice. Hear me in your mind's ear as you write. My tales are true, not fiction. True tales of a sea captain who lived nearly a hundred years ago. But you must have a routine. You will write in the morning, starting early. In the afternoon, we will go over what you've written, and in the evenings, I will give you fresh material. I shall have to go out sometime. No, no. But, Grandfather, I have to eat. I'll provide you with food. Food for the mind and spirit. That is what matters. Spend your money on pens and paper and exercise books with good stiff bindings. That's all you need. Believe me, Maria, that is all you will need. That and the dreams you'll dream. Tomorrow, you start writing. story you've told me, Grandfather, and the most marvellous tale of all. Then you will write it down tomorrow morning, as you have done all the others, rising at five as usual and going on till midday. Grandfather, I... I think that tomorrow morning I... I really should go out for a little while and buy some food. It, it's not that I'm hungry, though I do feel weak. And I've become so thin and so frail. And my hair's falling out. Listen, Maria. That does not matter. You must write the story tomorrow morning while it is still fresh in your mind. It is my best tale. And my last. When it's written, a life's work will be complete. You will be able to close the last exercise book and write... The end. What are you saying? It is the end, my child. This is the room, Doctor. She's here. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Maple. I rang as soon as I found her. I'd no idea she'd got herself into such a state. I hadn't seen her for a long time, you see. Yes, I got I the feeling that since she left work, she tried to avoid me. She was always punctual with the rent until this morning. When I didn't find the book and the money in the usual place, on the table in the hall, I knew something must be wrong. Yes, then I came up, knocked on the door, mm. and when there was no reply, I came in and found this. There's no food in the cupboards, nothing. She never drank milk, you see, so there was no telling she wasn't getting any nourishment. You know, checking the bottles the way you can with some people. Mm -hmm. There's nothing here except all these exercise books full of writing. It's as if she just went out of her mind, sat up here in solitude and complete silence, and wrote her heart out. Mm. Uh, Mrs. Maple. Yes, Doctor. Would you like to go downstairs and look after your daughter? I'll just examine her and be down in a few moments. Oh, of course. Sorry. Here I am, jabbering away, and you want to get on with your work. <laughs> Would you like a cup of tea when you come down? You were a long time, Doctor. Tea's ready. Oh, thank you, Mrs. Maple. Like you, I'm not shocked by death. I was present when my mother and my father died, so death doesn't shock me. It was how she looked like something out of one of those prison camps. 
She was like a little shriveled old woman of about ninety instead of a fifty-year-old. That's all she was, Doctor. Fifty years old. I've sent for an ambulance. There'll have to be a post-mortem. You're not sure how she died, then? I believe it was starvation, which, of course, leads to a natural self-poisoning. Has she any relatives? She never spoke of any. She didn't receive any letters to speak of, except tax forms and the like. So I've no way of knowing whether there were any relatives or not. Mm, I see. Mummy! All right, dear. They think it's a bit of excitement, don't they? I'll take care of the exercise books for the time being, if that's all right, Mrs. Maple. Well, I don't know, Doctor. Oh, they'll be returned when it's all over. They'll probably be needed by the coroner. Coroner? Oh, they'll have to be an inquest. But that needn't distress you. They'll simply ask you to describe the circumstances in which you found Miss Smith. Oh, I see. No one's going to blame you, Mrs. Maple. She wouldn't have welcomed any intrusion into her privacy on your part. Well, that's how it seemed to me these last few months, Doctor. She changed. She really did change. It wasn't for me to interfere. I'd probably feel as she felt. I like to keep myself to myself. Hello, Richard. What are you doing? Oh, hello, darling. I was reading. Oh, they look like exercise books. They are. What's in them? Hmm? Oh, stories. It's just that it's all a terrible waste. You mean they're no good? Oh, no. The opposite. Look, darling, I'm afraid you're not making sense. Well, Mary Smith, who apparently wrote these stories, was the lodger of one of my patients. I think she starved to death. My God! How awful! I think she was possessed by the need to get these stories down on paper. You mean she wrote herself to death? No, darling, it doesn't make sense. There are 20 stories here, set in Malaya and Africa in the 19th century, and they have an extraordinarily authentic ring about them. You must agree that it's more than strange a woman writing that kind of story. You could almost believe they were true. They're told in the first person by the central character, a Polish sea captain, trader. Oh. She doesn't even reveal his name. But seeing that he's Polish, the whole thing must be a figment of her imagination. But what an imagination! Then there's another thing. There's a terrible urgency about the writing. I'm no expert, but although every word is clear, in the later stories, when she must have been at her weakest, the handwriting has a strength, a fortitude born of suffering, as if she were determined to finish her task and, when complete, calmly lay down and die. Can I see them? Here. Hmm. I see what you mean about the handwriting. It is a bit wild and ragged. Especially towards the end. But there's an exhilaration about it. Exhilaration? Not fortitude, darling. Exhilaration is the word I'd use. Look. See how the lines slant upwards and the letters slant forward? It's... Well, optimistic handwriting. Wasn't too bad, was it, Mrs. Maple? The coroner was quite nice. He was very kind and understanding. Well, it's all over and done with now. I was pleased with the verdict. Death by misadventure? Yes. Better than all that talk about the balance of the mind being disturbed and all that, you know. Mm. What was in those exercise books you took away? They were mentioned, but not in detail. They were full of stories, Mrs. Maple. Very good stories. My wife's a part-time teacher, as you know, and she's reading them aloud to the kids in her class. They love them. Reminiscent of Joseph Conrad in some ways. I think it's possible that Miss Smith must have read Conrad when she was a girl, absorbed the feeling and style, and then, when her life became empty, she somehow recalled Conrad and produced her own similar creations. I don't understand all that. But I do know Jenny enjoyed hearing them. Jenny heard them? Not all of them. Snatches of them. She could hear Miss Smith reading them aloud. Jenny told me she used to sit outside her door and listen. She wouldn't make up something like that. No. No, no of course not. Well, Doctor, I'm glad Mrs. Rogers is reading them to her school children. At least all that work Miss Smith put into them won't have gone for nothing. Tell me 
about what happened to Miss Smith? I suppose I should have told you, Jenny, but I, I thought you'd be upset. Especially about her dying in the house. No, I'm not upset. I feel sorry for her. I feel sorry for anyone who dies. Why did she die, Mummy? She was old, I suppose. Her time had come. She wasn't all that old. I mean, she wasn't as old as the man. Man? What man? Didn't you see him? What man are you talking about? The one that came here to see her, of course, her visitor. I never knew she had a visitor. The funny old man with the dark brown face and funny hat and that great big white moustache. And you saw him? Lots of times. He was old. But he was very clever. Do you know, Mummy, he used to walk right through this door. It's true, without even opening it. That is clever, don't you think? Right through this door. I wish I could do that. Listen to the Silence by Rosemary Timperley starred Gwen Watford as Mary, George Pravda as the Captain and Patsy Rowlands as Mrs Maple. David Ashford was the Doctor and other parts were played by Heather Bell and Alexander John. Nigel Haver stars 